Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me. It's a Friday. I've got the good CIU Cup because all the students are beginning to show back up on campus. We're having a good time celebrating a great Christian school where there's a Christian worldview and where believers can come and get a great education. So if you're looking for something like that, check out Columbia International University. We're a partner with them here in Columbia and just enjoy that relationship to no end. There's another relationship that we're talking about here in 1 Corinthians 11. Yesterday, we looked at the observance of the Lord's Supper, something that Paul said was being abused by the Corinthian church. And today, he gives us some insights into it. Yesterday, he described it. And today, we're going to start down in verse 27 as he tells us how to prepare for it. He says, So then, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Well, here's a warning, a dire warning, it sounds like, one that we should all heed. Now, be careful how you heed it. I actually knew someone in the past who said, I'm not going to ever receive the Lord's Supper. When it was time for the observance, for the ordinance in church, they would refuse it, would not partake. The same action that an unbeliever would take or should take when they are in church, maybe as a guest, and say, well, you know, I I haven't, I'm not saved yet. I I haven't made a commitment to Christ. So it would not make sense for an unbeliever to partake of communion. I've known of some believers who have said, I won't do it. Why? And they would cite this verse. I'm just, I'm unworthy. I, I can't. Well, none of us are worthy of the perfection and the holiness of the Lord, but yet that's what we're supposed to be seeking. And as a part of that, do you not realize we have a command, a command to observe this ordinance, the Lord's Supper, some of you, some of you call that communion, uh, until Jesus comes. So it's not about, oh, I can't do it. If that's the case, then we shouldn't be observing it at all. So it's a bit of a contradiction in terms to say, no, 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 I I can never receive communion because I'm unworthy. Folks, listen, we are all unworthy in that matter. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. In fact, he's been discussing exactly why the Corinthians were abusing the Lord's Supper. And we'll get to some of that here in just a minute. The point is not to refuse the Lord's Supper, but it's to take it the right way. So he goes on to the next verse, verse 28. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. Falling asleep is that analogy used quite often in the New Testament to refer to death. So he said, if we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come. Now, let's back up on this and see exactly what we need to do when it comes to observing the Lord's Supper. In an article that's found in, for many of you who've had a classic in uh, in Christian history, you've carried one of these, the Christian Life New Testament. I bet some of you still have one of these in your pocket. It was great in that it contained outlines that could basically disciple someone in the truths of Christianity, and they were lined up in in the Bible so that folks could very simply begin to grow in their faith by just reading those from the New Testament and chasing all the scriptural references. One of those is about the judgments, and listed among the judgments is the judgment that believers need to put on themselves, self-judgment, every time that we receive the Lord's Supper. The purpose of that, that self-examination, is so that we can see how our hearts are in relation to our Lord, that we're not bringing unconfessed sin to the Lord's table and other other issues. What are, what are some of those issues? Listen to one commentator as he describes what Paul's trying to get across to us today. 
He said, you know, one can come to the Lord's table unworthily in many ways. It's common for people to participate in it ritualistically without participating with their minds and hearts. They can go through the motions without going through any emotions and treat it lightly rather than seriously. So the attitude of flippancy when coming to the Lord's table is a way to be unworthily taking the Lord's Supper. He goes on to say that they can believe it imparts grace or merit and that the ceremony itself, rather than the sacrifice it represents, can save or keep one saved. In fact, this is something that happens in many Denom- not many, but a few denominations where they believe there's some kind of magical grace imparted by you actually going through the ritual. And because of that, uh, you need to you know, participate because it makes up for all the bad things you're doing this week. Our, our Roman Catholic friends in particular in the belief of transubstantiation believe they are actually receiving Jesus, receiving the body and blood of the Lord. If you've witnessed to someone from a Roman Catholic background, and many of you have that background, I remember asking someone if they'd ever received Jesus, and he said, oh yes, I did Saturday night. I said, oh man, that's great. He wasn't talking about having prayed a prayer of commitment to Christ and repenting and turning his life over to Christ. He had attended Mass And in his mind, that meant he received Jesus. So, friends, even to think that these elements are anything magical, that they turn into the actual body or blood of the Lord and impart some kind of grace, is nonsensical. It's a symbol of remembrance for us to remember what Jesus did for us. And that's where the power lies. He goes on to say, many come with a spirit of bitterness or hatred toward another believer. And that could be toward another unbeliever, for that matter. Uh, They come with a spirit of hatred or bitterness toward a believer or come with a sin of which they will not repent. If a believer comes with anything less than the loftiest thoughts of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and anything less than the total love for his brothers and sisters in Christ, he comes unworthily. So what happens when you ignore the whole purpose of the Lord's Supper, which is to try to get you to be clean before the Lord, to recognize the power of his blood in your life every single day as we confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When you miss that, the Bible says you're in trouble because you eat and drink judgment to yourself. And in that particular case, you can expect consequences. Coming flippantly before the Lord's Supper or harboring sin in your heart means God, who loves you, is going to have to take you to the woodshed. He's going to discipline you. And many times discipline involves physical consequences. Now listen, every time someone gets sick, it doesn't mean God is spanking them. But it could mean that. Yes, the Lord may let you fall into physical calamity, illness, and even because the Bible teaches in in John's epistle in particular about a sin even unto death, Paul alludes to it here because he says, this is why not only many of you are sick and ill, many have fallen asleep. In other words, some people that have abused the Lord's Supper and have mocked God's sacrifice as believers have done this so blatantly that God has said the best thing for the church is for you to come on home, and they have been, could you say, executed by the Lord? Hmm. Disciplined by the Lord unto death? Yes, because they have been removed from you. Now listen, I'm I'm one of those pastors that's got an extensive ministry of 40 some odd years. And I hate to say it, but I've seen a few times where the Lord has had to discipline a believer within the church that was causing so much trouble that they either landed in the hospital rather suddenly, landed on sudden calamity, and a couple of cases have even died, I think, long before their time. Why? Because they didn't recognize this passage of Scripture and didn't recognize how important it is to keep a clear conscience before the Lord and to keep those relationships clear with other believers. And that's the purpose of the Lord's Supper. So when you come together to observe it, then you have an opportunity. That's the positive spin on this. He says if we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. 
So friends, every time we observe the Lord's Supper, there needs to be a little bit of time in which we as believers are called to not only look at the elements and recognize the body and blood of the Lord, but we also need to recognize what that means for us. That's why quite often I give an invitation before we observe the Lord's Supper, not after, that we give an invitation to say, hey, it's time to prepare your hearts and your minds. Is there anything you need to do to get right to observe the Lord's Supper? Some of those powerful times of its observance I can remember from just this kind of demonstration of God's grace. I can remember being in camp one time with a group of young people who were getting fired up for the Lord. And I remember as, and by the way, I'm not going to share a name because no, I didn't call and ask your permission to share the story today. But I know a dear friend in the Lord now who's an adult, but when he was an eighth grader in our youth group, as we were getting ready to observe the Lord's Supper, I talked about this need for self-examination. And you might need to call someone and apologize or get something right before we observe it. Many of those young people started getting things right among themselves. But one young man, this eighth grader, came to me and said, can I, can I borrow some money for the payphone? You can tell this was pre-cell phone days. And uh, I said, what do you need to do that for? He said, I've, I've got to call my mama and uh, I've got to call my parents. He says, if I'm going to receive the Lord's Supper, I've got to get some things right with them. And as he shared that testimony, and I won't go into some of the details of that, I was anxiously reaching into my pocket for a quarter to say, please go call, go call, because that's the purpose. If we examine ourselves, then we have this opportunity to make things right, to seek not only the Lord's forgiveness, but sometimes the forgiveness of someone that we have offended or we have held a grudge toward or something else, and walk into the observance of of the Lord's Supper, come to the Lord's table with a clean heart and a freshly forgiven spirit. And and for some of you like, well, what if I don't remember the sins I should be? Listen, don't worry about the stuff you can't remember. Just take care of the stuff that you do. And in those cases, we come not only to the Lord's table with more joy and celebration as we observe it, but we walk away stronger as believers in Christ and the church that once was broken can be healed. Thanks for joining me this morning. Have a great Friday and the Lord will see you tomorrow on the biblical perspective and each and every day next week as we wake up in God's word.